Is this the Paranormal Food Consciousness Podcast? This is the Paranormal Food Consciousness Podcast, and today we are starting the podcast with a tour of the Louvre Museum. It's so vast and beautiful. This visit will be the highlight of our vacation in Paris. I agree with you. There are so many works of art to discover in this magnificent museum. Did you know that it used to be a palace? Not surprised. Look at the different architectural elements from French Renaissance to the modernism of the glass pyramid outside. Yeah, and don't forget the Gothic remains in the underground. I didn't even know there was an underground. Yes, it's rumored that Mary Magdalene is buried under the Bois. No, really? Mm -hmm. Yes, and this will be a spoiler if you haven't watched the movie or read Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. Let's listen to the American Wikipedia version of the museum audio tour. Put on these headphones so we can listen without the noise of the museum. Oh. Okay, let me put it on. You got it on? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's listen. The protagonist of the 2003 novel, Robert Langdon, reads esoteric symbolism into the two pyramids. Mm. The inverted pyramid is perceived as a chalice, a feminine symbol, whereas the stone pyramid below is interpreted as a blade, a masculine symbol. The whole structure could thus express the union of the sexes. Moreover, Brown's protagonist concludes that the tiny stone pyramid is actually only the apex of a larger pyramid, embedded in the floor as a secret chamber. This chamber is implied to enclose the body of Mary Magdalene. At the climax of the 2006 film adaptation, the camera elaborately moves through the entire glass pyramid from above and then descends beneath the floor below to reveal the supposed hidden chamber under the tiny stone pyramid, containing Ooh. the sarcophagus with the remains of Mary Magdalene. I'll take off these headphones so I can hear you. Interesting, though Dan Brown is a fiction author. That's true. Though Brown was not the first writer to offer esoteric interpretations of the inverted pyramid, and... Anil Vorha, a blogger in the New Delhi capital region of India, examines some of the stories surrounding the pyramid. He notes that some research believe that the Hua used to be a Masonic temple, that the various glass pyramids constructed decades include Masonic symbolism. The downward pointing pyramid is said to express a Rosicrucian motto, which translated means visit the interior of the earth, and you will find the secret stone. Another researcher sees the two pyramids suggesting the compass and the square that formed the Seal of Solomon, which was written in the Da Vinci Code. Hmm. Well, I'm guessing our episode is going to have a focus on Leonardo da Vinci. And you would be correct. Ah, here, just around the corner. Hey, the Mona Lisa. The painting is kind of smaller than I imagined, but the crowd is much larger than I would have guessed and the line is moving so slow. Yes, it's a good thing we bought our binoculars so we can look at the painting while we're waiting. You see anything? Can you see it? Uh-huh. Uh, wait a minute. Well, uh, hmm. I see what looks like an alien high priest in the painting. No. What? Let me, let me see those binoculars. What did you see? Well, okay, look at the facial features and then the headdress. The cloak and those hands. Oh, oh my, my goodness. I heard rumors that Da Vinci hid secret messages and codes in his artwork, but I didn't expect to see what looks like an alien. You have to squint, though, to see it. It's kind of difficult, but I see what you mean. What do you think it means? Let, let me try to Google that. There's not a good reception in this hall. Um, let me try to find here. That's what happens. Okay. Well, found it. Uh, the Scottish Sun writes that there is a video by Paranormal Crucible which claims the Mona Lisa was painted in order to conceal important historic and religious facts, possibly regarding the extraterrestrial present and its surreptitious involvement with the Roman Catholic mm -hmm. Church. They also claim that an alien is hidden in Da Vinci's St. John the Baptist masterpiece. St. John the Baptist is here in the Louvre. 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 This is correct. Louvre. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, here we are, finally. Finally, in front of the Mona Lisa. Hail from Earth, high alien priest. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, wh what? wait, do you hear that? 
What is that? What is... What? What's that? Everybody's starting to freeze. I don't hear the museum sounds anymore. Oh. Uh, I'm vibrating. Why is everybody frozen? Oh, I'm starting to see through you. And losing consciousness. Hey, ooh, where where are we? Oh, oh, I think we're home. Was it just a dream? I don't know. That that was pretty weird. Yes, weird. But I'm hungry. Let's get on with the show. Okay. I'm hungry. Let's get cooking. Okay, today we're going to make garlic torte, a medieval vegetarian dish in honor of Leonardo da Vinci. We'll talk about why and the variations that we're going to make in just a few minutes. This recipe will be on our website. The basic recipe consists of a pie crust made of one cup of flour, two egg yolks, a third cup of butter, and two to two and a half tablespoons of water. Now in this recipe, I used einkorn flour because einkorn is one of the earliest, if not the earliest, form of cultivated wheat, which I thought would be more authentic to the time. Where'd you find that einkorn? We can put a link on our website. You can get it online at Amazon or you, sometimes your grocery store might have it. Okay, that's good. Mm, it's more, it looks like it's more nutritious. And lower in carbs than regular flour. Yes, it is. The original recipe for the pie crust is from a 16th century book called A Proper and New Book of Cookery, which is a compilation of medieval and renaissance cookbooks compiled by Duke Cardiac of the Bow and Duchess Diana Vellina. The recipes books at the time were typically very general, so the recipes we will use will be inspired from them. And our listeners might have variations that make the dishes even better. Yes, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. If you try one of the recipes on our podcast or come up with a tasty variation or want to suggest a recipe we should try that has some connections to the paranormal. Speaking of food, let's get back to the pie crust. I used a food processor, but you can blend everything by hand and roll it out if desired. I made three different small pies using 5.5 inch rounds. Now, there really wasn't enough crust to fill out those, and there's actually more filling than fits in that. So if you were going to do something like what I do, I would increase the amount of dough you had for the pie crust because you really would need to fill like four, maybe even part of a fifth. But again, I wanted to try different variations. And so it was a little different than if you were just making one pie. Well, I'm proud of you because I think I can only make one pie and you made three pies. <laughs> so that's good. Yeah. So when, let's talk about the filling. Now, on the website Medieval Cuisine, Uriol of Lothian, who is a member of the Society for Creative Anachronism, SCA, and a researcher of, of medieval foods, has a basic recipe for garlic tort filling. And again, these will be on our websites. It requires 8 ounces of ricotta cheese and 8 ounces of farmer cheese. Or, if you can't find farmer's cheese, you can use queso fresco, a Mexican cheese. So if you do this, you should add a couple of tablespoons of heavy cream because it's a drier cheese than farmer's cheese. Mm -hmm. So that's what I use because I, they were out of farmer's cheese in the market. Or you can so you use you oh. the queso fresco? Yeah, I actually use oh. queso fresco. Yeah, because I asked the lady at the counter, you know, well, she said she was out of farmer's and she suggested I could do that. It's just a little drier. Oh, so, okay. um, but really, the way that these come out, you could experiment with the cheeses that you think would well in a quiche-like dish. So in addition to that, we have three large eggs, a fourth cup of butter, and one pound of garlic. Ugh, wait a minute. One pound of garlic? Are we trying to protect against vampires? Well, 
we could do another episode on vampires. But no, really, seriously, uh, an entire pound of garlic. And so that's, that's what crazy. I did. <laughs> that's I went to the store and I, this morning and I bought an entire pound of garlic. I actually was going to try to get the already peeled garlic because I thought this was going to be a lot of work, and it was. But they didn't have any of that. The thing is... <laughs> that would have been more expensive, too. Yeah, it would have it would have been more expensive probably. Then I did get organic garlic. You know, as we'll talk about later, I thought it came out pretty good. Hmm. Um, so why are we making garlic torque? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci was purportedly a vegetarian. He passionately denounced the slaughter of animals and loathed meat. Da Vinci he lived from 1452. Whereas the medieval era, often called the Middle Ages or Dark Ages, began around 476 AD, following the great loss of power throughout Europe by the Roman Emperor. The Middle Ages would span roughly a thousand years, ending between 1400 and 1450. Mm, okay, that's close enough. Yeah, so we can assume that some of the recipes carried through 1450. Even though da Vinci is purported to be a vegetarian, there are really few references to it. In uh, the book, The Heretic's Feast, A History of Vegetarianism by Colin Spencer, he writes about da Vinci's view. Let's read. Renaissance man himself, Possibly the greatest draughtsman ever to have lived, possessed an infinite curiosity which drove him on an unstinting examination of life's myriad phenomena. Yet in the 60 or so biographies in the London Library of his life and work, only one book bothers to discuss his vegetarianism. Freud wrote a book analyzing Leonardo, seeing in him a man in conflict between pity and aggression. As symbols of the former, Freud cites Leonardo's vegetarianism and his habit of freeing wild, caged animals at the market. Da Vinci's views on vegetarianism and his pity for animals were no secret. Hmm, I had no idea that he was a vegetarian. Yeah, so so we looked. Uh, I went and looked and tried to find some vegetarian uh, recipes from that age. Hmm. There's more. They, there is throughout Leonardo's scattered notes a rising disgust with man himself. As here, he says, the king of animals, as thou hast described him, I should say rather, king of the beast, Leonardo writes, now, does not nature produce enough simple vegetarian food for thee to satisfy thyself? And if thou art not content with such, canst thou not by the mixture of them make infinite compounds, as Latina describes and other writers on food. Leonardo was clearly aware of vegetarian cuisine. Hmm. Yes, and so, you know, trying to find some references, uh, apparently there's this person, Bartolomeo Sachi, called Il Platina, wrote the first Italian cookery book since Epicus. He belonged to a club, the Academy, which was for lovers of classical antiquity. They used Greek names and studied the philosophy and thought of the ancient world. Such pursuits were considered pagan and could bring changes of charges of hearsay. A valid idea of the cooking of the Renaissance can be gathered from Platina's collection of recipes. In the meantime, the cooking of the Renaissance Rome reached an apex of sophistication, art, and gluttony. Leonardo would have been only too aware of the endless lavish feasts given by the great families of Rome, Florence, and Milan. Hmm. He was kind of out of sorts in that, in yeah, that kind he of was a situation. A, yeah, real lover of, uh, of animals. Mm-hmm critical of the state of man. Mm -hmm. uh, Platina's book on lawful pleasure claims interest at the beginning of the book of only a moderate diet. So she suggests a moderate diet. Or it's he or she ill. So he. The book is divided into eight sections. Fruit and seasonings, nuts and herbs, salads and meats, poultry, 
prepared side dishes, sweets, eggs, and frying. It became a great success. Poultry, doesn't that require? Killing, yeah. Yes, you're right. So one would assume that Da Vinci followed uh, all, all but the poultry section. But so still, a pound of garlic? <laughs> I, I, I'm still trying to imagine eating something with that much garlic. Keep away those vampires. <laughs> I, I went and got a pound of garlic. It was about $12 to get that much. I peeled all of the paper, like, yeah. you know, skin around the garlic. And then I put it all so it still had the covering on the, each of the cloves in the water. The recipe called for 10 minutes, but I thought after 10 minutes it still seemed firm. So I went ahead and boiled the cloves for 15 minutes. And the skin came right off. I mean, it was still a bit of a work to take the skin off. And I also wore some of those nitrile gloves so that I wouldn't just smell like garlic for the rest of the week. You probably still are going to smell like Yeah, probably. Oh, and open... <laughs> probably the other end. <laughs> <laughs> probably. And I'll... And I'll put some of the pictures on our website. So after peeling all the garlic, boiling it and peeling it, it, it was over two cups worth, just a little over two Ooh, cups of garlic. That's so much. I know. So is all this garlic going to deter vampires? <laughs> yes. No. Well, it depends on your source, actually. Uh, the National Geographic Society newsroom ha actually has an article, Six Ways to Stop a Vampire. It's based on National Geographic's historian... Mark Jenkins' book, Vampire Forensics, and the work of the National Geographic grantee Matteo Borino in the Cemetery's events, for which there's a, it's a topic of a National Geographic special. So let's see what they say about garlic. Garlic. The traditional belief, belief that garlic's odor deters vampires may have originated with disease rabies. In 1998, writes Mark, Spanish neurologist, I wonder if that's 1888. We'll have to look that up. Spanish neurologist Dr. Juan Gomez Alazno made a correlation between reports of rabies outbreaks in and around the Balkans, especially a devastating one in dogs, wolves, and other animals that plagued Hungary from 1721 to 1728 and the vampire epidemics that erupted shortly thereafter. Wolves and bats, if rabid, have the same snarling, slobbering look about them that folklore ascribed to vampires, as would a human being suffering from rabies. Various other symptoms support the rabies vampire link. Dr. Gomez Alzon Al Alonso, Alonso. Alonso <laughs> found that nearly 25% of rabid men have a tendency to bite other people. That almost guarantees transmission as the virus is carried in saliva. Rabies can even help explain the supposed aversion of vampires to garlic. Infected people display a hypersensitive response to any pronounced olfactory stimulation, which would naturally include the pungent smell of garlic. Hmm. So what are the five other ways the other five ways let me look that up and i can also check that date uh, actually it does say in 19 oh in 1998 they did say this, so that date was correct so the other ways that you can stop a vampire are mirrors and, and sunlight crucifix and holy water a stake through the heart decapitate and burn and finally a brick stone and or vine between the teeth vine between the teeth. yeah a vine <laughs> I'd never hmm. heard that before. Mm -mm. We can make this a subject of an upcoming episode. Okay, but I'm not eating garlic. <laughs> mm -mm. <laughs> okay, so we're going to examine what foods other than blood for the vampires can eat. Yeah, when we do an episode on it, we can dig into this a little bit more. Maybe we've talked about the actor Barnabas Collins. You remember him? from the? He used to play a vampire in the Dark oh, yeah. Shadows. Dark shadows. That's very, very long ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. It's, it's... Ooh, dark shadows. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at the history of garlic. Now, this comes from 
Philip Simon, who wrote this article in the USDA website, and he writes that garlic is among the oldest known horticultural crop. In the old world, Egyptian and Indian cultures referred to garlic 5,000 years ago, and there's clear historical evidence for its use by the Babylonians 4,500 years ago and by the Chinese 2,000 years ago. Some writings suggest that garlic was grown in China as far back as 4,000 years ago. Garlic grows wild only in Central Asia, centered in Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan today. Earlier in history, garlic grew wild over a much larger region and, in fact, wild garlic may have occurred in an area from China to India to Egypt and to the Ukraine. This region where garlic has grown in the wild is referred to as its center of origin, since this is the geographical region where the crop originated and the only place where it flourished in the wild. In fact, although we sometimes hear about wild garlic elsewhere in the world, this is is the only region where true garlic routinely grows in the wild without the assistance of human propagation. There are other plants locally referred to as wild garlic, but invariably these other species of garlic genus are not garlic itself. Garlic, if you look at the site Occult World, they talk about how it is used in occult practice. Garlic is is a protection against witches, demons, vampires, the evil eye, and other supernatural forces, and an ingredient in folk folk healing remedies. Garlands of garlic worn around the neck or hung in a house are said to ward off evil spirits, creatures, and spells. In Mexico, the ajomacho is a huge garlic, sometimes as big as a baseball, used exclusively as an amulet against evil in general, but not against specific curses, which require their own special remedies. According to custom, the ajomacho will work only if it is given as a gift, not if, if it is bought. In Europe, the phrase, here's garlic in your eyes, is said to ward off the evil eye. <laughs> in times past, garlic was used to prove guilt. Suspects tossed garlic cloves in, into a fire. The one whose clove popped was guilty. In healing for folklore, garlic is widely reputed for its ability to cure and prevent colds and other ailments. It is baked in bread, ground into powder, and made into liniment. Ancient Roman soldiers wore garlic into battle for extra courage. In ancient Greece and Rome, garlic was placed at crossroads as an offering to Hecate, the goddess of witchcraft and the night. Odysseus used garlic as protection against the witchcraft of Circe, who turned his men into swine. There is a site called Witchipedia that describes some of the magical attributes of garlic. According to this site, garlic is masculine in nature and associated with the planet Mars, the element fire, and the sign Aries. It is sacred to Hecate and is a suitable offering to her left at crossroads. A spell from the American West to send away an unwanted lover is as follows. Place a clove of garlic intersected with two crossed pins where he is sure to walk. When he walks over it, he will lose interest. A potion with the opposite effect was made of a strand of hair of the target's hair. Threads from his or her clothing, alcohol, and garlic. Somehow, you had to make the target ingest this, and then he or she would fall madly in love with you. Garlic cloves can also be used with other things to stuff puppets intended for negative magic. Garlic braids hung over the door repel thieves and envious people as well as bring good luck. 
change the braid every year. Hanging garlic over a bedroom door will draw lovers into it. Garlic is said to have aphrodisiac powers when eaten. Wiping a knife with garlic juice empowers it against negative entities. A clove of garlic can be added to any mojo bag to strengthen its energy. Garlic is used for exorcism, spell breaking, invoking passion, protection, and strength. So let's discuss how to make this. What I did, because I wanted to try different variations, and the reason I wanted to do the variations is the instructions were just like add uh, strong and sweet spices and add raisins. And the only spice really called out was saffron. Raisins and garlic? Yeah. (laughs) On the website that I had mentioned earlier, she recommends that you actually make it without any spices. So I did a third of the batter like that, and I made it without any spices, just Hmm. no spices. And then the second one that I added the saffron into the basic recipe, about a half a teaspoon. Then a half a teaspoon of ginger, a quarter teaspoon of clove, and about a fourth teaspoon of cardamom. I blended that all together in the food processor and added two tablespoons of raisins. And then in the last variation, since we don't know what they mean by sweet and strong, I added a half a teaspoon of vanilla powder, a half a teaspoon of vanilla extract, and one teaspoon of cinnamon and two tablespoons of raisin and blended that all together. In French cooking, they had cinnamon. It wasn't as well known as it is today, back in the medieval. There's reason to believe that cinnamon might have been of the area where Leonardo da Vinci. So I took those pies and I put them in the oven at 400 degrees or 205 degrees Celsius for 45 to 60 minutes. But 45 minutes was plenty for them. You didn't need to cook it the whole way. I tried a little bit when they're hot, and I think they're much better cold. So I put them away. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, brought them out and had my husband try them with me for dinner. And and the base version is very, very good. Amazingly, even though it's that much garlic, it's very mild. It's actually a very pleasant garlic taste. It would make Hmm. a super quiche. If you wanted a quiche with a garlic taste, oh, it, it would it would be really good, uh, quite delicious. And he could absolutely see us making that again. The one that just had the saffron and a few of the other spices, you know, the cardamom, a little bit of clove, ginger, and then I put the raisins in whole as I mixed them up, and that was okay. I mean, it was it was definitely a different dish. It it stood by itself. The saffron just creates a completely different dish and you didn't feel like it you should add anything like with the original recipe you could feel like you could add either more vegetables or or some meats or vegetarian substitutes is there cheese in this at all well yeah farmers cheese or the oh yeah farmers and and the ricotta yeah okay so it was and and like i said i i added a couple of tablespoons of heavy um, so it's just like a quiche, sort of, because it's got the, it the is, cheese it's, base. It's just an amazing amount of garlic. I, yeah. It mm, is that it, too but, much. but yeah. it works. Now, version three, my husband, we neither of us liked that version three. Mm. <laughs> it was like, yeah. I could see maybe back then you, you might have a taste for it. It sort of tasted like something you could have with mulled wine or, or something, but... I don't think I'd make that one again. And and I don't think I'd make version two again either because version one was pretty good. So it was a good experiment. I think Leonardo da Vinci would be proud of us. You have leftover? Yes, yes. We'll be we'll be having some tomorrow too. I'm not coming to your house for a week. <laughs> no, okay. really not bad. You can't even smell it. Says you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can offer it to the alien high priest i don't know that maybe maybe garlic is worth its weight in gold who knows well you know when they when they saw those pitch they had to play with i guess they took a picture and they played with it lightened it in order to bring out some sort of image of a alien and then i don't believe that some of the stories about messages in the inverted triangle have borne out either but they're interesting stories to think about what next time we go to paris 
We'll just have to check it out some more. Was that on the menu anywhere that you went last time you were in Paris? Oh, no. I don't think they did that. I wonder why. <laughs> hmm. Okay, viewers. You're welcome to try this dish. Wonderful dish. Hmm. Let us nice know and what garlicky. you think. I, and again, I recommend version one. Uh, <laughs> And it would be fun to try using pre-peeled garlic to make it go a lot faster. But I, I just don't know how that will work, because a lot of times that's preserved with citric acid. Yeah, I think just... Yeah, Do it the, the old-fashioned way? Yeah. Or elephant yeah, garlic, yeah. where it's really huge, so you won't need that many cloves for a pound. Hmm. You might have to boil it longer. But, yeah, hmm. let us know what you think. Leave comments for us on our website. Yeah, thank and... you for listening. We appreciate it. This has been the Paranormal Food Consciousness Podcast.